Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I'm the curator here at Ashland, and uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, we are we have a very very special Wake Up with Ashland this morning. I think you'll really enjoy. Um, it gives us a chance to talk about a really important subject. Um, really, the first time we've ever done this comprehensively in this manner. So um, we're really excited about the opportunity to do that, and um, look forward. Uh, to getting into this subject. Good morning, Mr. Chenault. Nice to have you with us. Um, I want to thank uh, Dupree Mutual Funds. Dupree Mutual Funds has generously supported our program since the beginning and continues to do so, and we appreciate their making it possible for us to be with you as we have for most of this year. Uh, so thanks to them for that. Uh, so without further ado, today we're going to talk about a very interesting subject. We're very fortunate that we're in a position here at Ashland to actually talk about this uh, subject. You know, most places like Ashland really, frankly, aren't. Um, and that is, we're going to talk about the three known images of people who were enslaved at Ashland. Um, it is very, very rare uh, to find images of enslaved people. Most enslaved people had uh, neither the means nor the opportunity to create images of themselves. Um, during the period of enslavement, uh, photography, for example, was very expensive and very limited, uh, and they simply weren't able to do that, and they weren't necessarily even been permitted to do that. Um, so we don't have images, for the most part, of people enslaved at Ashland. Uh, occasionally, you'll find images of people much later than that, after enslavement, uh, once they've become free. We don't even have those at present. So. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a few that we have, and it's even more interesting that two of the three actually were done while the people depicted were enslaved. That's remarkable. Good morning, uh, George Goss. Good morning, E.F. Kainzig. Good to see we have some viewers. It looks like maybe some new viewers. So we're glad to have you all. Thanks for watching. Um, so it's, it's exciting that we can bring this to you, and a lot of this starts with an artifact we acquired just this year. Um, and we're very excited that we're able to do these things because we've acquired this artifact. So without further ado, this is Charles Dupuy, enslaved African American uh, here at Ashland. Uh, this drawing of Charles was done by an artist named John Nagel. And he did this drawing on November the 20th of 1842, which is why we're doing this program today. This is literally the day on which this drawing was drawn. And I think that's pretty incredible. Uh, to not only have images, but have an image in this case that is so thoroughly documentable is just absolutely remarkable. Uh, so we're really pleased that that's the case. And you can see that Nagel not only drew a really amazing image, you got close to that, there's a lot captured in that image. Uh, it's a great likeness, really amazing. But he tells us that the age of Charles was 30 or 34 or 35. Then he goes on down here uh, and he says, Good morning, Sue. Sue is our one of our more faithful volunteers, a board member, and my assistant curator. Uh, Charles Dupuy of Mendenhall Memory, a slave belonging to the Honorable Henry Clay, drawn by John Nagel from The Life, Lexington, Kentucky, November 20th, 1842. Emancipated by Mr. Clay, December 9th, 1844. That's a ton of information. To have that information is just truly amazing. Uh, good morning, Julie. Julie is a descendant. Uh, nice to have her with you. And you're right, it is truly stunning. It's a, just an amazing piece. Uh, it captures such an incredible moment in time. Now, Nagel was here to paint a painting of Henry Clay. That painting is generally referred to as the father of the American system. It's quite large. Good morning, Cindy. Uh, there are two originals. One is at the Union League in Philadelphia. That's the one he was actually commissioned to do. He did a second, which he sold to the United States government. It hangs over the United States House of Representatives in Washington. Uh, but he was painting those when he did this drawing. We actually have a copy of the American system here at Ashland. It's pretty spectacular. We also have a painting in the collection uh, upstairs in the dressing room. That is a bust portrait of Henry Clay that is thought to be an artist's study that Nagel did here while completing the American system. So this is one of two Nagels 
that we have in the collection. This one we know absolutely unequivocally is a Nagel. The other one uh, we believe to be so. So, uh, Nagel tells us a lot about this portrait. He writes a letter, and this is a scan of said letter, um, which is at the Filson Club Historical Society in Louisville, Kentucky. They provided us with a scan, um, and it's a really fascinating letter. He talks about his visit to Ashland in all sorts of detail, and it's an incredible story. Um, and he goes on at great length about Henry Clay and Lucretia and how wonderful they were and how they treated him and essentially invited him in and made him part of the family for the three months or so that he was here painting the American system. But he also talks about Charles a great deal. Um, he talks in, in the first page about Charles, uh, and here he refers to him about Mr. Mendenhall, Mendenhall memory. He talks about Charles uh, lighting the fire in the room where he painted, which happens to be the drawing room, which is right over there. So, and the reason that Nagel was in that room is that there were at that time three windows in the original drawing room, so there were lots of sunlight. So, Nagel interacts with Charles on a regular basis uh, because Charles is lighting the fire, etc. And he goes on uh, further in the letter uh, to say that I shall sketch Black Charles also to bring home with me. He is a happy fellow and is a Chesterfieldian in all the rules of etiquette of high life. And that's an interesting statement. I actually had to look that up. I frankly was not familiar with the term Chesterfieldian, um, so I looked into it. And the term Chesterfieldian is derived from the first, fourth Earl of Chesterfield, a British noble. Uh, this particular British noble lived... Uh, at the end of the 17th and early 18th centuries, good morning, Stephanie, and apparently wrote a book of etiquette for his son, uh, telling his son how to be an, a, a proper gentleman, how to be a man of good manners, uh, good repute, etc. So what Nagel is saying is that Charles was extremely well-mannered, extremely refined and courteous. And that's a really neat statement. And it says a lot about who Charles was. Um, Charles probably had certain expectations put upon him by the Clays in terms of how he would act around other people, particularly other white people. But I think he also probably wanted to create an image for himself, to be a certain person, and that was a person of refinement. So that's a really powerful statement. Obviously, um, Nagel refers to Mendenhall a number of times. And that's another important part of this. Who, who is Mendenhall? What does that mean? Well, for that, we turn to this artifact from our collection. It's a speech that Henry Clay did, remarks of the Honorable Henry Clay on the abolition petition presented him at Richmond, Indiana, October 1, 1842. This is actually a copy that belonged to Henry Clay, was given to him by a friend, um, and I think it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek, I thought you might want to remember what you had to say on this day, um, but it belonged to Henry Clay. Another interesting thing that Nagel says in his letter is that while he was here, Clay gave this speech, this, these remarks to Lucretia. So he got to hear Clay deliver this himself even though he wasn't at Richmond on October 1st. I think that's really fascinating. And maybe Clay read right off the page we're looking at now. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Mary. More of our faithful volunteers. Good to have you. Good morning, Patty. So that's an amazing thing. But this is a really important document, a really important speech. Clay had gone to Richmond, Indiana, gave Clay a petition signed by Mendenhall and a number of other people present, asking Clay to emancipate the people he enslaved. That didn't sit well with Clay. He was most perturbed that he would be invited as an honored guest to this event and then be treated in this manner. He saw that as a complete breach of hospitality and was not at all pleased uh, about the speech. Clay then goes on to address the abolition petition, and he speaks of a number of things. First of all, he talks about the value to him of the people he enslaves, how much they are worth monetarily, and what that would mean to him to emancipate them. Good morning, Molly. So you can see here, he's thinking of this in economic terms. He's thinking of them as property, which is how he viewed the people he enslaved. But he goes on to talk about these people, uh, the great care that he gives to them, how well-treated they are, how happy they are. 
And he goes on to ask, if I emancipate them, who's going to take care of them? This is a very paternalistic view. Many slaveholders held this paternalistic view. It made it possible for them to enslave these people because they thought they were doing a good thing for them, that they were helping them out or taking care of them, uh, even though they could have very easily taken care of themselves and would have been much happier doing that. This also gets to something Nagel says. He calls Charles a happy fellow. Charles was at this speech, and Clay says that if you want to know about slavery at Ashland, talk to Charles. He'll tell you how it is and how happy he is and how happy people there are and how good it is. Does Charles believe that? I think absolutely not. I think he's doing something he has to do. It's an act of resilience. It's a way to survive in a very difficult circumstance. He's doing something that he has to do in order to make his life better, to make the lives of his family members better, etc. So he is being, to use a phrase used at this time, a happy slave, uh, so that he can get better treatment from Henry Clay. And that, I think, is what Nagel saw when Nagel was here. So that's really an amazing thing, to have all of this captured together in this way. Now, as far as the image goes, in terms of its history, Nagel says in the letter, I'm drawing this for myself. So I think he took it home. I think he put it into a portfolio or kept it in a box or something like that as a personal memento. Um, I don't think he had any intention of it ever really being seen. Um, it was not something he intended to be in the public eye. It was just something he wanted for his personal use. Uh, and I think it stayed that way for a long time. Now, we don't know exactly what all happened from that time until 1925, but I think what might have happened is that Nagel had it. He had children. He died in, Nagel died in 1865. He had children. I think one of them inherited it and kept it. And I think eventually either his children, maybe his grandchildren, gave it to the people, the family from whom we acquired it. Uh, we can document that family as early as 1925. There was an exhibition at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, April 12, 1925, oddly enough, Henry Clay's birthday, for, to May 13, 1925. And... This, is, this was a grand exhibition of as many works by Nagel as could be found. Um, this is the original catalog, which is also in our collection. Up to page 150, reference to the drawing of Charles Dupuy. Uh, so it was clearly exhibited in this exhibition. So we know in 1925 it has come into the ownership of the family from whom we acquired it. So... It passes through that family, and we eventually acquired it earlier this year. So uh, we know pretty completely the history of this piece, and it's just remarkable, uh, just amazing to have something that clear and that well-documented with that much information attached to it. And we have other images, two other images to talk about. This is one of them. This is the image of Aaron Dupuy, Charles's father. Now, this is a stereo card. Stereo cards became popular uh, in the 1870s and 80s and remained popular all the way into the 19-teens and 20s at least, uh, up until the era when movies really became popular and then following that TV. These were a form of home entertainment, uh, typically viewed in a viewer, uh, and they function on the basis that human beings have stereoscopic vision, which means each eye sees an image and the brain puts those images together to create a 3D picture. This goes into a viewer, and it has reflectors, which result in a 3D image when you look at it. Um, it is an interesting image. You'll see Aaron here. He is in livery. Livery was clothing provided by the clays that was designed. Good morning, Brenda. Brendan. It was designed to exhibit their wealth on the person of someone they enslaved. So in this case. Uh, probably downtown Lexington, hard to say. Uh, he's wearing his livery. He's even wearing what I believe to be a wig, uh, which would have been part of that livery. We know very little about this image. I don't know why this stereo card exists. I don't think this is the most original version of this image, but it is the earliest surviving. There are two of these. They are at UK Special Collections. One is in the Henry Clay Memorial Foundation papers, which came from Ashland. 
1991. The other is in a collection called the James Clay Family Papers, which was donated to Ashland and then transferred over to UK probably five or six years ago. And it's got the other copy of this. Uh, we don't know when this was taken. My guess is possibly in 1857 when the cornerstone of the Henry Clay Monument at Lexington Cemetery was set. And the reason I guess that is that Aaron drove the family carriage and it was the only vehicle allowed into the cemetery. And so he would have been in town and that would have been a, an important occasion where he might have been photographed. Could have been at other times. I just don't know. We don't have that information. Um, if we flip the card over, you can see it's marked. The family marked it. And it has the name O.C. Jinks, Artist, Fenton, Michigan. And it also has Peninsular View Company, Fentonville, Michigan. I don't know much about those. I tried to look those up. Didn't find anything. So again, I don't know what this was created from. Based on the fact that it was probably done in the mid-1850s, we're talking about an, a daguerreotype, an ambrotype, or perhaps a tintype. Uh, those would have been the media available at the time, uh, most likely. So uh, that would have been later copied into a stereo view. So we just aren't sure. One thing that we do have, one clue, is from a letter from Henry Clay's grandson, Charles Donald Clay, to his mother, Susan. This is James's son. He writes to his mother, this is a, a letter uh, from the James Clay Family Papers at UK, uh, please thank Mr. Wilson for the picture of Aaron, Uncle Aaron, he gave you for me. Send it to me when you have a moment. So we know that Charles received a picture of Aaron in 1884 from someone named Mr. Wilson. I think this is the, Char the image that Charles is referring to because the James Clay papers passed through Charles's daughter, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Clay Blanford. So I think this is the one that he's referring to in this letter. So that gives us a date when he receives it of 1884. And that fits. That's about the right time period. We don't know who Mr. Wilson is. One possibility is a man named Robert Burns Wilson, who was a very prominent artist and poet, best known for writing a poem called Remember the Maine, about the blowing up of the USS Maine in Cuba. It helped get America into the Spanish-American War. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, George. Nice to have all of you with us. Uh, so there are a lot of unanswered questions here. Uh, what, is, what is being captured in this? What is the event? Just don't know. Uh, hopefully someday we'll continue doing research and maybe be able to answer more of these questions. But it's a fascinating image, and we display a reproduction of it here at Ashland. Now, we have recently learned of a third image, an image uh, that we had no knowledge of until literally probably two months ago or so. Um, and this image is mentioned in a letter at Library of Congress. And I learned of this uh, from a researcher with whom I had worked a while back and who has recently published a book. Her name is Dr. Whitney Martinko. Dr. Martinko uh, is a professor in the history department at Villanova University. Uh, she chairs their public history track and wrote a book called Historic Real Estate, which deals with historic preservation in the early republic. Uh, and she talks about Ashland and its rebuilding by James and cites this letter as something she found at the Library of Congress. It's a letter uh, from James's wife, Susan, to her sister, Lucy. These are excerpts from it that I've copied into this page. Uh, Susan says, I have a new photograph of Mammy Lottie, Tommy and Susie. Don't you wish you could see it? Mammy, I assure you, looked her best. She tried on two dresses before she could suit herself and at last had the good taste to wear her black silk she bought in Europe and with the collar Miss Kate gave her and the new head handkerchief she got in New York. I assure you, we all felt very proud of her. She deserves to be thus handed down to posterity, for she has been far more useful in her generation than many who are above her in station and whiter of skin, and her likeness deserves to be prized by my children. That, good morning, Julie, says a lot. That's an amazing statement. Now, we had no idea this photograph existed. And to know that there is an image of the woman who sued Henry Clay for her freedom is truly staggering. I hope that we will eventually find this. I am searching for it, and I do think there is a possibility that we will be able to find it. 
And certainly if we do, you can imagine there will be a wake-up with Ashland to deal with it. Um, so anyway, that is an amazing image. Now, Charlotte in 1855 had been emancipated for 15 years. By that time, uh, would have had the opportunity to craft a life of her own. She's still living nearby because her husband, Aaron, is still enslaved here. Um, he was never freed, so she, she didn't go far. May have, in fact, been living on the estate. Uh, but she is a free person. And you can see she wants to look a certain way. She is taking charge of her image, uh, creating her own image, uh, wanting to create an image of herself for posterity. She's worrying about how she looks, etc. Wanting for the first time for people to see her as a person rather than as property and seizing that opportunity. Now she talks about in here the black dress that she wears. Uh, she went with James and Susan when James was charged affairs to Portugal. So I think that's when she bought that dress and bought the material for it. Uh, she would have gone back and forth through New York when they did that and that's probably when she bought the headscarf. Uh, good morning, Anna. Uh, so we have some good idea when those things were acquired. Uh, it talks about two children, Tommy and Susie. Those are grandchildren of Henry Clay. So those are children of James and Susan Clay. Tommy is Thomas Jacob Clay. Susie is Suki, Susan Jacob Clay. Tommy was about two. Susie was about five. So she probably was holding these children. And that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Um, you know, she would have cared for Clay children, did care for Clay children for many, many years. Um, and to some extent was still doing that, I suppose, uh, at that time. It also shows that the family, in some way at least, revered her and wanted to remember her. So there is a connection that develops. Even though they enslaved her, and I'm sure they still view her in many ways as inferior, they do have this feeling of, of admiration for her in some way. Uh, and it's interesting uh, what they say about how useful she has been, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, it still reaffirms her place as inferior, but it says she has, uh, it, it shows respect for the things that she's done over the years, I suppose. Um, so it's an interesting statement. Uh, and it says the likeness uh, deserved to be prized by the children. And unfortunately, at this point, I don't know how the children felt about it. I've never seen any other reference to it. I am hoping it still exists. And if it does, it's probably in a collection uh, that I'm working to gain access to at the Library of Congress. It was put there by Tom, uh, the child in the picture. Um, and we'll see if it is, and if so, maybe that'll tell us whether and how they actually did prize this image. So, like I say, it's remarkable we have these images, that we have so much information about these images, uh, and that we can show them to you. And there are still lots of questions. Like we say, where is this image? Why was this image taken? Did Charles know that this drawing was done? We don't know that. Did he pose for it? We don't know that. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to know because it would tell us perhaps what Charles did or how he tried to have himself portrayed. Did he take actions like Charlotte did later on in some way to control his image and to make sure that his image was preserved in a particular style or manner? We don't know. Um, again, all things for further research. So an amazing, amazing group of stories for sure. And I'm so glad that we we're able to present them to you. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions at this time. Well, thank you very much for tuning in today. Uh, everyone, have a happy Thanksgiving and please be safe. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon on Wake Up with Ashland.